Today's text is Luke chapter 13, verses 18 to 35. He said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like, and to what shall I compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. And again he said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you began to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open up to us. And he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. And then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and taught, you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. At that very hour, some Pharisees came to him and said, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, Westwood. Glad that you've joined us for worship this morning. I I hope you agree with me that worship is not just an hour that we spend together at 10 a.m. on a Sunday, but that your your week is worshipful every day. I pray that that's the case, of course. And uh, this is just a great time to worship with our family, isn't it, as we get together. And so I hope you'll grab a notepad and a pen and maybe take some notes as we go along. Maybe find some nuggets that you can take into your quiet time throughout the week and continue our time of worship this morning in your home. So let's open with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for just this time that we have to gather around your word as a family. Father, we praise your name today. We've come here to worship you because you're worthy, Lord. As we just sang, Father, you are worthy in every way, and in the name of Jesus, we come to you today. It's because of Jesus that we can come to you, Lord. So just praise your name. Father, we lift up our church body, of course, and every person here, every family, every prayer request. We surrender these things to you, Lord, and lay them at your feet. For the churches around us, Lord, we lift them up as well. There are some, Father, that are preaching the word, preaching the gospel very clearly, and we pray that you you build them up and grow them closer to you, Lord. And those that are not, Father, that, that you would uh, bring in Christians that would preach the word, that would share the gospel accurately and teach straight from your word, Father. We just praise you. It's your word we're gathering around. So I pray, Holy Spirit, this morning that you would illuminate your word, that you would draw us to you, that we might know you more intimately. Father, search our hearts and reveal sin. Just shape our hearts to be more like Jesus every day. We are here to worship you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. 
Well, if you remember, we are continuing our study in the book of Luke. We're in chapter 13, so you might go ahead and turn there. There is a, a Bible in the pew in front of you, and, uh, and if you want to grab that, you can turn to page 820, and you'll find our text today. I, I guess we should not call those pew Bibles. Those are now chair Bibles, but uh, whatever. If you, if you don't have a Bible, take that with you. That's our gift to you, and uh, we'll have to think about what we call it. So let's start with kind of a bird's eye view of where we are this morning. You know, we are in the book of Luke, and we're in a section of 10 chapters that are unique to Luke. They are not found in any other gospel, From starting with chapter 9, verse 51, through chapter 19, we see Jesus on his path, on his final journey to Jerusalem. You might remember back in chapter 9, the text said, As the time approached for him to be taken to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. So he knows his path is taking him to the cross, and yet he takes the time to stop along the way and to preach and to teach and really just to love on people. And so in today's passage, where we are today, Jesus has sort of been building and building a theme uh, as he's been kind of getting to this point of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. Let's just start with that and talk about the kingdom of God. My first question is, what is the kingdom of God? Now, in my mind, initially, if you were to ask me, my thought goes to heaven, I I picture God on his throne. I I picture worship happening there, right? And so when I think of the kingdom of heaven, I think of something that happens someday in the future, just initially. And I love love the end time stuff. I love eschatology. I like to read the book of Revelation and the last half of Daniel and Ezekiel and Zechariah, some great books pointing to that day where we're in heaven together. But before we can dive into today's study... We need to make something very clear, and that is that the kingdom of God is not something that happens in the future. The kingdom of God is not something that just happens in the future. A lot of Christians, I think, incorrectly believe that God's kingdom has nothing to do with us today. It only comes in the end time. But Jesus' second coming is simply the consummation of his present reign. So I think we should take note of that initially here. I love John Piper. He's got so much emotion. You can just hear it in his voice. But here's what he says as he defines God's kingdom. He says the basic meaning of the word kingdom in the Bible is God's reign. It's not his realm or his people. It's not about a geographic location or a group of people. It surrounds the fact that God reigns. I love that. The kingdom of God is about him reigning, him ruling, him governing. And believe it or not, some some do, some don't like it or not, submit to it or not. The fact is that he alone sits on the throne of this universe. Is God reigning today? He is. Did Jesus come to to save us from our sin and connect us to a holy God? He did. We don't have to wait for a future kingdom. It is here now. John announced this earlier in the book of Luke when he says the kingdom of God is near. Basically what he's saying is Jesus has arrived. The king is here. He's just around the corner. And then after he was arrested, Jesus himself said in Mark 1.14, It says that he came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, if we want to stop for a moment and just apply that to our evangelism, as we're sharing the gospel with other people, I think it's very important that we stress the fact that you don't have to wait. You can experience and be included in the kingdom of God today. Last week, Dave brought us up to Luke 13, verse 17, and in that section, 
Jesus had just finished telling everyone, repent. And if you don't, you'll perish, right? Repent or perish. Some pretty strong words. Those are some pretty strong words. And, and Dave said, I love this quote, Jesus' primar- Jesus is primar- primary message here is people need to be able to stand rightly before God. That's exactly right. Jesus was focused on their need. Are you safe? You need to repent. For if not, you too will perish. And so we, we also heard last week about the story of Jesus healing a woman in the synagogue. This is probably the last time he was in the synagogue, by the way. And he heals a woman on the Sabbath. And that story, as we lead into today's passage, is really an introduction to this theme of the kingdom of God. Because her problem was not just physical, it was also spiritual. Verse 16 says, Satan kept her bound for 18 years. Why do you think she was in the synagogue? To be saved, to be rescued. And so Jesus steps up, he says, you are free. And then he touches her. Again, not just physically, but spiritually He says, you are free, and she immediately praises God. In that moment, she's escorted directly into the kingdom of God. Her heart is now ruled and reigned over by God. So we can experience the the kingdom of God today, right now. That woman would say, yes, you can. Anyone who's accepted Christ would agree, yes, I'm experiencing the kingdom of God today. Because the kingdom of God, it sets people free. Free from the bondage of Satan and from the bondage of sin. Today, today. Everything that is crooked, including the backs that are bent from the weight of Satan, will be straightened and God will be given the glory. So the kingdom begins with us at that moment of salvation. When we accept Christ as our Savior, as our rescuer, we become one of those citizens of his kingdom. He now reigns and rules over our lives. Now again, going back to evangelism, we think about, I think it's good to think about our own moment where we came to Christ, and uh, I think it's important that as we are sharing the gospel with others, that we share our own story, our testimony. I can remember when I came to Christ, fully surrendered. I mean, I just wanted to grab anybody and say, do you know Jesus, right? And share the gospel with them and share my story with them because I was so excited for what what God had done in my life. Many people, you know, when they come to Christ, it's, it's hard to let it all go. But the moment you do, you have that freedom instantly, right? And you become an overnight evangelist when you experience Christ in that way. And like that woman, we just want to praise the Lord because the kingdom has come. So these verses, 10 through 13, that Dave covered, really becomes a turning point for Jesus' teaching. Repent. Be made right with God. Don't perish. Experience salvation that only Jesus can bring because the kingdom of God is near. Next, let's look at verses 18 to 21. We're in chapter 13 still yet. And twice, right here off the bat, we hear Jesus specifically talking about the kingdom of God. Listen to what it says. He's going a little deeper with this theme. Then Jesus asked, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? It is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air perched in its branches. Again he asked, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus does not get specific. He does not give us a specific definition He describes it through parables. The first one is the mustard seed. He teaches that God's kingdom is growing upward and outward. It starts small, but it grows. 
like a mighty tree with birds nesting in its branches. You think about it, within 40 years of him quoting that parable, the kingdom of God had already grown, and Christianity had already grown to most corners of Rome. So the kingdom of God is growing. And it's growing inward as well. That second parable teaches that the kingdom of God grows in us. You really can't see yeast in dough, but it works its way through the entire batch and bubbles up and grows, right? The dough is this world that we live in, the world around us. The yeast is the kingdom of God as it's displayed in you and I. And that spirit-led Christian has been injected into the world, and the world doesn't even realize it. You could be sitting at Chipotle or Culver's or wherever your favorite place is, and someone walking by might not even know you're a Christian. You could have a cross on and a bumper sticker. They might not get it. But the bottom line is, while they don't see it, the Spirit is working and growing in you. And you're influencing the world, and your testimony and your righteousness is making a difference. Lives are being touched. They're being changed. And just like yeast that permeates and bubbles up, we're changing the world around us. Think of it this way. Think of the opposite. If there was no Christian in this world, what would it be like? Be no influence whatsoever. And so the power of the kingdom is impactful. It is extensive. The kingdom is like the yeast. And so as we grow closer in God's word, in our fellowship, in all of our Christianity and be more Christ-like, we're growing inwardly beyond what anyone could imagine. So Jesus is teaching that the kingdom of God grows visibly and invisibly. Now, how, we, how do we apply that to, to our evangelism? Well, I, I instantly think of two things, and that is, number one, preach the kingdom. Preach the kingdom. The gospel work of Jesus brings an entire kingdom. It's a kingdom where the rule of Satan is broken, and the work of God spreads outwardly and inwardly. But then secondly, preach confidently. Know that God is at work, and know that your Sharing your, your testimony and sharing the gospel with others is making a difference. Absolutely. In Christ, we are winning the battle. We are not in a losing struggle. I know sometimes it can feel that way. But God is at work in and through you. And so do the work of evangelism by preaching the kingdom and do so confidently, knowing that God is in control of the results. Now, in this passage, in these parables, Jesus kept it very simple. I believe that's why he used a parable, because these people were ready to throw him onto a throne right now and make him king. But if he had allowed them to do that, I think there would be a lot of misunderstanding had he become an earthly king, a misunderstanding as to how he is our king. He, he came to be crucified and that's important. He came to die, not to be put on a throne yet. And so even though he repeatedly says, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand, he would only be made king through crucifixion and resurrection. And the disciples really could not fathom that yet. So he kept it simple. But the kingdom of God is a spiritual rule over our hearts and lives for those that are willing to submit and be a part of that kingdom. There are some that are not willing to submit to God's reign over their heart, and they are not in God's kingdom. Which brings us to that next passage. Look at verses 23 through 30. Through the healing of the woman and the two simple parables, Jesus has introduced the kingdom of God. But here... He now urges people to enter it. Someone comes to Jesus with a question, verse 23, and says, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? Are only a few going to be saved? 
he said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. I don't know about you guys, but when I hear that, that's a shocking response, right? That's shocking because a lot of people believe there's a heaven, but very few people believe there's a hell. Many people lean on the fact that Jesus loves everyone, but very few will believe that he's willing to reject sin and cast sinners into hell. I mean, I think it's 82% of all people in America call themselves a Christian, but only 9% of them uh, subscribe to a biblical worldview. It's, so it's a legitimate question. But I would ask, saved from what? What are we being saved from? Are we being saved from an empty life to a full life? Uh, are we being saved from poverty to prosperity? Are we being saved from inadequate feelings about myself to feeling good about myself? That's not what we're being saved from. To put it bluntly, we're being saved from the severe wrath of God. Our sin requires punishment, and God will judge our sin when we die. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 says this. It says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. I mean, it's no wonder Jesus is speaking with urgency. We're sinful, and, and we're covered with sin inside and out. You can't wash it off or cover it up with good works or trying to be a good person, sin will be dealt with. And God's wrath, it's terrifying, right? Take a look at what his wrath looks like. In verse 28, here this text describes the result of those that take the wide path, the easy way through life, instead of that narrow door or gate known as Jesus. It says, listen, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourself are thrown out. Can you imagine that? That non-Christian is escorted past the, the celebration in heaven, looks over and sees all the Christians feasting with Jesus and worshiping God, so happy to be there as then they are turned away and escorted out the door. It'd be shocking. Such deep sorrow, weeping and gnashing of teeth. In a parable found in Matthew 13, 31, Jesus said, the Son of Man, that's Jesus, the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of the kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. Pause right there. That's the unrepentant sinner. That's people that refuse to surrender to Christ, even the ones that say that they're a good person. So the angels will weed out of the kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Listen. We're being saved from God himself. We're not here to talk about what you can get out of this life. We're here to talk about eternity, the fact that we need saving, we need rescuing, that we need Jesus. Are there just a few that will be saved? Jesus basically is saying it doesn't matter how many. It only matters that you be one of them. The number doesn't matter. You matter. So he responds to that question by saying, make every effort. And down in verse 30, he's talking about self-denial. And he says, there are those who are last who will be first and first who will be last. Listen, it's either about you and your kingdom or it's about you surrendering to Christ and the entire kingdom of God where he reigns and rules over your life. There are a lot of decisions you can make in life, lots of crossroads 
You can make a decision today. It impacts your day or for the month or for the year. It impacts your year. You can make decisions, good and bad, that will have consequences for your entire life. But in today's passage, Jesus is talking about consequences that have eternal importance. Again, let's apply this to evangelism. That question, are only a few going to be saved, is about the kingdom of God. So Jesus is calling people into the kingdom. He's calling out their sin and calling them to repent and inviting them in. That's a sense of urgency in his voice. Make every effort. He's the perfect evangelist, right? And so our evangelism needs to have an honest urgency about it. I think sometimes we find it easy to share the gospel slowly over weeks and months, but sometimes we have a hard time being urgent and blunt right now. Today is the day of salvation. It's important. Too many people act as if hell is only a conceptual problem. They act as though it's not real and that there's really no kingdom to gain or lose. I can remember sharing the gospel with a friend one day, and we were talking. I had kind of outlined the gospel to him and shared, and his response was this. You know, I just don't believe in hell. I think it's a concept that's designed to scare people. That was his response. And so I, I think it's important that we are able to see the deeper problem and hear what they're really saying there. Because if my friend could reject the idea of hell, then he was giving himself permission to reject the idea of sin or needing a savior, even reject the idea of God. And if all of these things are fairy tales, as he put it, he didn't have a problem. And so remember that passage I quoted a moment ago, Romans chapter 1? Listen to it again. Men suppress the truth of the... By, I'm sorry, men suppress the truth by their wickedness. What may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. So my friend was simply suppressing the truth that God had already made clear. So I turned the conversation to the real problem, which is sin, which is what Jesus does. He says, you have a problem. Repent, right? Don't perish. And, and, and sin is one of those conversations that you can be honest with, that we've all got sin, and it's no fairy tale, right? We get it. We understand that concept. But being able to then share that we have a sin problem that, that cannot come into the presence of a holy God, now what do we do? And so I'm able to as we share the gospel, change that and be focused on the real issue here. Jesus says, make every effort. He's speaking of self-denial. He spoke of standing rightly before God, as Dave would say it. And he's talking about how salvation brings in a great feast in the kingdom of God. Now, those final verses. Let's jump down to verses 34 to 35. As I read this, I want you to listen to the sorrow in Jesus' voice and see if you can hear it. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Here's Jesus. He's on the road to Jerusalem, probably for the last time. It is for the last time. And he's on the road to the cross. And he is mourning, not for himself, but for Jerusalem. He's acknowledging that Jerusalem, really the entire nation, has not been willing to accept him. He says, I wanted, but you weren't willing. He had offered them the kingdom of God, and they rejected him. So he's rejecting them. And it's shocking, really, because these are God's people, right? 
And so that makes it difficult. But when Jesus says, your house is left to you desolate, he's saying, you're on your own. You're on your own. Like my friend that cut himself off from God by denying the truth, Jerusalem had cut themselves off from the kingdom of God by rejecting Jesus. Now what Jesus is experiencing here literally is grief, right? It is the very definition of lament or sorrow. There's pain in those words, O oh, Jerusalem. Can you almost hear the groaning? But despite the pain of rejection, at the same time, he knows God's in control. He knows the end of the story. And ultimately, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. And we know that because we hear it in the word until. The word until, he says, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That word until indicates that it will happen. It will be fulfilled at a second coming. He's basically saying, you will confess me. You will know me fully. And so there is some relief in knowing that God is sovereign. He's in control, but it still grieves his heart. Does that make sense? Speaking of grief, last weekend there were five of us that went to a biblical counseling conference down in Chattanooga. And they were all great talks. It was fantastic to go. But there was one speaker that stood out to me, and he was preaching on grief. And there was one point that he made that I loved. He said, for the Christian, when you've experienced loss or pain in your life, you have a place to take that grief. He said, it's, it's only in God that pain and trust can coexist. Because life is hard, but God is good. Isn't that true? In other words, we take our pain to the Lord and we cry out, I hate this. I hate this situation, but I know you're in control. Or I'm brokenhearted and I'm hurting, but I know you love me and I trust you. Pain and trust can live in the same heart when you know Christ is your Savior. And so I think with evangelism, we need to remember that. Each of us have got someone in our lives that we love so deeply, it hurts us that they have not come to Christ. We share with them, but our hearts are broken. We're grieving over the fact that they've not come to Christ yet. At the same time, God knows. God knows. And the Spirit is working behind the scenes in ways that we might not even see. And so we can take that grief to the Lord and just be honest with him. Father, I want this person to love you. I want them to live for you. I want them to put you first in every area of their life. Help me to be patient and obedient as you lead. I trust you. I trust you. And I know that you're in control. You can, you can do this knowing that he's doing things you haven't even asked for yet. And that gives us peace. So in closing, listen, the kingdom of God is him reigning and ruling in our hearts. Every believer gets to experience the kingdom of God today. Is it fully here? Well, not yet. But it's growing. It starts with Jesus, his disciples throughout Rome, and now Christianity has infiltrated the world. Be encouraged by that. The big question, though, really is, which path are you on? Are you on the wide or the narrow path? That, that wide path, certainly easier path, it's very me-focused. And if you hear nothing else I say today, please hear this. The kingdom of man and the kingdom of God cannot both occupy the same space. They are mutually incompatible. But that, that narrow path, let's think about Jesus as the, the gate. Though less popular, it does not emphasize external requirements, but instead an internal transformation that leads to a life in heaven. If you want to be a part of the kingdom of God, it must be on his terms. It must be through Jesus. 
As it says in Acts chapter 4, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men which we must be saved. And so for the believer, share the gospel. Every day in some way, preach the kingdom and do it with confidence. Think back over your own salvation experience and share your story. Talk about the impact of sin and talk about how God wants to rescue people from his wrath. Tell them to make every effort as Jesus did. And then when you're done, pray. And pray and then pray some more because that's one of the most important pieces of evangelism is that we pray and tell, very honest with God, and we know you're in control. We know you're in control, and we know that you love them even more than we do, Father. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. You teach us, Lord, to pray, your kingdom come. And so, Father, that's what we ask this morning. Bring your kingdom. Now, even though we aren't able, Lord, to experience the full kingdom yet, I pray that you bring your kingdom Bring your reign fully in people's lives, in my life, in the world. Father, this morning we lift up every lost family member or friend, every coworker. We want them to know you and experience your kingdom. But we also trust that you're at work, Lord, and we know that you're sovereign in all lives. And so this morning as we go, Father, I pray that you would just go before us in all that we do choreograph our steps. Lord, help us to see opportunities to share Jesus, and we'll give you all the praise. In Christ's name we pray, amen.